Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next uh, episode of uh, the ICANN Next Talk series. Uh, my name is Christian Nijhuis. I'm a full professor at the University of Twente, uh, chairing the group of hybrid materials for optoelectronic devices. But I think most of you already uh, have seen me before on this channel. So I will continue uh, with what has been going on in this month. So last week, we had a very interesting session in honor of uh, Africa Day. And today, of course, we have uh, Francesco Stilacci. And next week, we're going to have Luis Lismarzan. Uh, and in the last week uh, of this month, we're going to have also a lecture from Rebecca Kramer Portiglio. Uh, this is uh, today's team. As uh, the two panelists, we have Liu Xiaogang from the National University of Singapore and Wendy Barclay from Imperial College London. And as a special challenger, we have a PhD student from Caltech, Xiaotian uh, Ma. But today's speaker is Francesco Stellacci from uh, EPFL, Switzerland. Uh, he got his PhD degree from materials engineering at Politecnico de Milano back in 98 with Professor Zerbi. He moved on as a postdoc in a group of Perry in a department of chemistry at the University of Arizona. And in 2002, he became an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Material Science at MIT, uh, where he also got tenured in 2009. But in 2010, he moved as a full professor to EPFL. Stellacci is very productive, has published more than 150 papers, about 15 patents, and has obtained many awards and fellowships. Uh, notably, he got the TR35 Top Innovator Award, um, and he is also a fellow of uh, the Young Global Academy of Sciences and the European Academy of Sciences. So without further ado, I would like uh, Francesco to start his talk about uh, supramolecular broad spectrum antivirals. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I will try now try to share my screen and please confirm that you see my slides. Yes, I can see your slide and I can Perfect. hear you. Perfect. So what I will be talking today about is something that maybe uh, one wouldn't expect from somebody with my background. I'm a material scientist by training. And it's something that I'm very, very passionate about. It's the development of antivirals. The logic in what I'm, I do comes from the fact that when I moved to Europe, I wanted to introduce something new in my lab as a research line. And I was confronted uh, with um, data that looks like this. Now, I know this slide is pretty busy, but it, let's start from the right side here. In red, what you see is topped the cause of deaths in low-income countries in 2016. The red ones are communicable diseases. Blue ones are non-communicable diseases. And then the rest is injuries here. Now, what you can see is that uh, there is a lot of red. If you actually do it in a broad way, you will learn that in the developing countries, it's about 50% of people that die of communicable diseases. Now, if you then ask yourself, how are we doing in terms of fighting communicable diseases? You will see that there are bacterial diseases against which we are very well prepared because we have antibiotics. There are still some bacterial diseases that frighten us, for example, because of the emergence of strain uh, uh, or resistant strain to antibiotics. But there are still uh, diseases like malaria that really require more work. But the biggest hits that we have that cause these diseases here, lower respiratory infectious diseases, diarrheal diseases, HIV, um, these three, they are viral diseases, mostly viral diseases. And so you can now move your attention to the right side of my slides, where what you see is a list of viruses, human viruses, 
with the condition they cause. Now, whatever has a violet uh, um, highlighting, a violet box highlighting the, the name, is things against which we have a vaccine. When we have a red box, continuous or not, around it, is things against which we have a drug, an antiviral. The first thing that really jumps to the high is that we have a lot of black, really a lot of black. This is an old slide uh, made in 2016, as you can imagine. You can see here SARS coronavirus. We already in 2016 for SARS-1, we were highlighting that there was no vaccine, no virus, no drug. That leaves us completely at the mercy of viruses. Not just us, the people that live in rich developed country, but us, the whole world. Because in the whole world, you can die of diarrhea. And there's about 1,500 kids, age one to five, that die of diarrhea every day. These are significant numbers. And we should be doing something against these things. Now, you, we can do it with vaccines. And vaccines are the best prevention tool we have. But if you get a viral disease that is not rabies, where there is an exception, once you get it, it's too late to vaccinate yourself. You will like to have a drug. You may live in a country where the vaccination plan is not pervasive. Then you need a drug if you get a disease. And we have very few drugs against viruses. And in fact, here, this is my personal opinion. The continuous red box highlight the only two drugs that we have against viruses that are excellent. HIV and hepatitis C. The rest are drugs we have that are there. They're better than nothing, but they're not ideal drug. So the summary of this slide is, there's a lot of people that die in developing countries of communicable diseases, mostly viral. And we will need to develop a lot of drugs to help them and a lot of vaccines too. Huh? It doesn't end there. When I started working on this field, my friend virologist presented me with the realities that I'm showing you on this slide. If you focus on the right here, what this plot is showing is a truth that is in front of our eyes and has always been. Again, this is another slide that comes from 2016. Starting the 70s, there has been a new virus that has emerged or re-emerged every four years. People my age were born that HIV didn't exist, that dengue didn't exist. Zika was a name that meant nothing to me. And all of these things, and let alone the whole SARS family now, and all of these things are here. And when a virus appears, we are at the mercy of this virus. This plot here is the average lifespan of American people, people in the US, in the last century. So as you can see, as humanities, we've done pretty well, starting the centuries at 47. In Europe, at that point, I think it was around 55, to be honest. But now we're all about around 78, 79. But this dip right here, sorry, this dip right here, this is the Spanish flu. This is how hard a virus will hit. Just as a reference, if I'm correct, this is Second World War. And you can see what a virus can do. Now we're all experiencing another pandemic in our life. That is that of SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. COVID-19 has worldwide decreased the average lifespan of a year and a half. So around here, there will be a much smaller dip. In, but that dip is where the line has almost no noise. So it will be noticeable forever. And if we were to plot the um, gross uh, world uh, uh, product, so the economics of the world. In 2020 and 2021, there will be a dip that will be there for history. 
So let's summarize what we have here. We have a need for many drugs against many viruses and many vaccines. And, but we also have a need for drugs and vaccines against viruses we don't know, viruses that will emerge. How can we do this? How can we address this? There are many approaches. My idea has been for a long time, why don't we challenge ourselves to produce the equivalent of penicillin in the antiviral world? What's penicillin? It's antibiotics that is broad spectrum. And now there are many other broad spectrum antibiotics. Why don't we go after this dream of making a broad spectrum antiviral that will work in developing countries against many, many viruses. So we don't have to develop many drugs, but also that could be there before a virus appears, but has a good chance of working when the virus appears. But now, the biggest problem once you get this vision is the question that I put on this slide is, can a material scientist like me develop a drug? Not a drug delivery mechanism, not something else, but just a bona fide drug. I thought I could for a very simple reason. We can ask ourselves the question of what is a virus? And there is a very stringent, uh, important biological definition of a virus. But for a person like me that is a material scientist working in self-assembly, I can tell you that arguably is a virus is the most complex uh, biological object that is non-living. Because you have to remember that a virus doesn't have a metabolism. And so it's an assembly of genetic material, of proteins, of lipids, that together parasitically can reproduce, but they cannot reproduce by themselves and they don't need a metabolism to exist. So it's just an equilibrium assembly. Now, under that uh, hat of just looking at an assembly of things, I was immediately struck by something. What you can see in this slide is the viral replication mechanism. A virus will attach to a cell, enter, unpack, replicate, repack, and exit. This is super simplified version. But already here, if you look at it in the eyes of a self-assembly, you start wondering, a virus unpacks and repacks in a replication mechanism. The difference in concentration is not enough to justify this. So then there must be a energy landscape for this so that it can exist in two opposite form, the packed and the unpacked. I can simplify what I'm saying, asking you to think about this question. If a virus unpacks and repacks in the same replication cycle, which one of the two is the spontaneous event? Is the unpacking a spontaneous event? or repacking. Both cannot be because they are in the same cycle. Now, when you read virology paper, it turns out that some virologists, the majority, believe that the spontaneous event is unpacking. That is that the packed version of a virus is in a local minimum and there is a barrier. But once you pass this barrier, you get to the unpacked event and repacking must be helped by other uh, effect enzymatically and so on and so forth. So then you start asking yourself, okay, is there a way for me to lower this barrier and make a virus unpack? If I make a virus unpack, unpack I can actually make a drug. That was my thinking long time ago, exactly 10, no, sorry, exactly 13 years ago, 2010, 2011. Now, at this point, you need to learn more about how drugs against viruses work. But uh, actually, before that, let me tell you that this thinking of packing and unpacking led my lab to develop ways to actually um, stabilize viruses. And why would you do that? When you make a viral vector for a vaccine, like the one that, for example, the Oxford team developed 
during the last SARS-CoV-2. We have a problem of a cold chain, that is at room temperature, a virus will actually lose its infectivity, mostly, mostly because it will lose its integrity. And this is weird because we just said that a virus pact is in some form of a local minimum. Then how does it look? It loses integrity. Well, it loses its integrity because no matter how high your barrier is, there's always a certain finite possibility of having some oscillations around your equilibrium position that bring you to the unpacked position. Now, if that's the case, we formalize this with a statistical mechanic um, treatment. This was in collaboration with my dear friend, Vincenzo Vitelli. And we understood that that barrier can be made, if you want, taller, you can stabilize a virus if you actually have la large negative charges surrounding the virus, or if you make the capsid more rigid, or if you actually make the medium more viscous. And we used nanoparticles, polymers, and sucrose to put negative charges outside to rigidify the capsid or to make the viscous more medium. And in all cases, we were able to stabilize a virus. So we can stabilize a virus. Can we destabilize it to make a drug? That was the research question. That's the research question. Once you have all of this understanding. Before doing that, we uh, one needs to look at how drugs against viruses are made currently. These drugs against viruses are commonly divided among other types of dif uh, differentiation in three uh, families. The first one is a family that has a mechanism that's called antiviral, sorry, antiviral with antiviral mechanism. This mechanism is simply a mechanism that blocks viral replication inside the cell. So an antiviral drug will, is a great drug because one drug blocks many, many progeny. Not only that, it's a great drug because we know how to dose it because it's the usual way we dose drug. We dose it proportional to the host cell that the body has. The limitation of this drug is after years of research, these drugs have not become as broad spectrum as they could potentially be. There's very few drugs on this family that have high efficacy. And so some of these drugs have shown problems with mutations. So I decided to take another path not saying anything bad about this path because I think this path has a lot of potential. The second path that one can think is probably the path that everybody in my audience right now could be thinking. And that path is, what if we just break down a virus? It's the simplest idea you have. You have a virus, let me break it down. If I do that, I'm gonna go from using a mechanism that's called virucidal. This comes from the antibiotic world because there, bactericidal antibiotics are antibiotics that break down viruses. Now, it's very easy to make a virucidal compound. Alcohol, strong surfactants, acids, they're all good against viruses. And in fact, we all used to that when there is a viral infection, we are told to wash our hands, either with soap or with some form of alcoholic um, cream or suspension uh, uh, and so on and so forth. In the lab, we use these things to clean our lab of viruses and we use also acids to do that. The problem of this approach is, again, apparent once you think about this famous replication mechanism of viruses. Because if you look at the viral replication mechanism, you'll clearly see that the virus is made of the same things than the host. In fact, the virus doesn't even have a 
a way of producing its own lipid. It just hijacks the lipid membrane of a cell, of a host cell. So if you're made of the same thing, the things that break down chemically the virus will do the same on the host. So it's very easy to make a virucidal compound. It's very difficult to make a virucidal drug because of toxicity problem. There is a third approach that exists, and that approach is the virostatic approach. Virostatic approach simply means creating something that binds to a virus or to a cell receptor that binds to the virus so that you block viral uh, cell, host cell interaction. These are, among these, there are entry inhibitors. So by blocking this interaction, you prevent the virus to enter the cell. It, this is something that, for example, monoclonal antibody, antibody do. The, and they are great, and they're all great things about them. They're very sensitive to mutations. And somehow, some of them are also expensive. But there is a simpler way to actually produce an M3 inhibitor. And that way is that of producing glycans, sugars, that look like the glycans that, they, that the virus targets on the cell. And if you do that, the, you run a competitive competition assay uh, in the body. These, these sugars will bind to the virus, and by doing that, they will prevent viral cell interaction. This approach is great, and I'll tell you in a second why it is great, but it has one limitation. You are basing everything on binding, and binding is a reversible event. As soon as, and in fact, we all know that we characterize binding with a KD, a dissociation constant, which we give in terms of a concentration. Once your drug eludes in your body below the concentration, what will happen is that the complex will dissociate and you release a perfectly infective virus that will start the replication mechanism. Because of this, this approach has had ter terrible problems in getting to the clinic. Yet, it's a great approach because it's non-toxic for the most part with the limitation of this sentence because it actually imitates glycans, so uh, sugars that are on the cell membrane. You're trying to be biomimetics if you want. So you, you do something that is not so toxic. Second, it's been since the 50s, if you want, first paper in the... 47, that I, that, uh, I could find, huh? um, that we know that this approach is actually broad spectrum. Why? Why is it broad spectrum? But this was understood 64 and then here later, if you want. But it's broad spectrum because we now understand that viruses target only few um, glycans on the um, cell membrane, Be, and these are the glycans that the host has a, a for the host it is problematic to mutate. So if you want the, the viruses target highly conserved glycans on the cell membrane, and in order to prevent mutation against them, and these are very few in human viruses. I'm not expert in other type of viruses. If you actually take heparin sulfate proteoglycan and sialic acid, you are going to get that about 80, 90% of human viruses that are not waterborne target either one or the other. Some exceptions um, are there where some viruses we haven't determined which one they target and some like SARS-CoV-2 right now, we think it targets both. Um, on top of that, um, it's very easy to imitate heparin sulfate proteoglycans. Heparin does it. It's something that we know very well how to do. The problem with this, it's only that this approach is reversible. Other than that, heparin is a 
polymer that was used already in, during First World War, I've been told, as an anticoagulant. It is for sure an anticoagulant. I haven't checked if it was really used in First World War, but people used to live with this thing uh, on their whole life or for a long time. That's how low toxicity heparin is. But if you want to use this antiviral, unfortunately, as soon, the, as soon as the concentration goes below a certain amount, you release an infected viruses and you lost your infectivity. Because of the simplicity to do an heparin sulfate proteoglycan mimic, there has been in the literature a uh, heparin-like compound that have all sorts of flavors. It's enough to put a sulfate or a sulfonate on a natural polymer or a synthetic polymer on a dendrimer on nanoparticles, and you'll do an heparin-like uh, molecule that will actually uh, block viral infection in vitro. During the 80s, people tried to address this reversibility problem by making uh, compounds that bind better and better and better to the virus. So with lower KDs, people have gone down to nanomolar single digits. The key that was understood to, to achieve this goal was to use multivalency. So to have multiple sulfate or sulfonate presentation to the virus, and this allows you to go to very low binding. But no matter what, no matter how low, at one point a good drug must elute, must be excreted from the body, and so it will lose efficacy. So then there was a movement that said, okay, then let's actually forget about a systemic drug. Let's make a topic, topical drug. So a drug that doesn't elute. And this is this idea, I will explain you with an example, has been, uh, has arrived to phase three clinical trial as creams that were used, vaginal creams that are used to prevent HIV transmission. Unfortunately, this clinical trial has failed royally with the placebo group doing statistically better than the group that took the drug. Why? Why something that works so well in vitro failed? There is a possible explanation, and that explanation is the following. A cream that has this drug is actually a sponge for the virus. It has things that bind to the virus. That's the role uh, of those drugs. Now, if there is a lesion in the vaginal tissue, the cream will actually elute in the bloodstream, dilute below the binding constant, and actually act as a Trojan horse bringing the virus first inside and then releasing a perfectly infective virus. And this is why these things didn't work. So then here comes my idea. I thought to myself, I want to do this, as I've explained to you. I want to break a virus. But there are these great materials that are non-toxic. They're very good at binding viruses. Can I find something? that actually binds to a virus and after binding will actually break it. If this can be done, I can think of something that breaks only what it binds to and not what it doesn't bind to. And so it has a chance of being virucidal without being toxic. To achieve that, I had an idea that comes from other part of what I look in my lab, I research in my lab, I look at liquid solid interfaces between water and proteins. And I know uh, that I personally have not found an exception, any exception, that proteins exposed hydrophobic to water. I'm trying to understand why with little success so far. Um, now, if protein exposed water, my idea was the following. I am going to make a drug that looks like these multivalent heparin-like um, uh, compounds that I was telling you about. So something that presents sulfates or sulfonates in a multivalent way. But I'm going to add to this drug hydrophobic groups so that once the drug binds to the virus, 
there will be proximity by from with the exposed hydrophobic of a protein and the hydrophobic that are on the compounds. These things will bind tightly in a secondary geometry. Why? Because short range hydrophobic interaction in water are the strongest possible. They're stronger than anything else that you have. So these things will bind. There will be a strong tight binding between the two. And this will happen after the multivalent binding. So we'll force the protein in a secondary structure. This will apply a pressure. That was my idea. And that pressure will end up breaking the virus. And if this happens, I've done even more than what I've dreamt for. Because now I'm applying a pressure on a virus and that pressure is breaking the, vi the virus. And that pressure will break only assemblies that don't have a metabolism. If I apply the same pressure on a cell, on a bacteria, the cell of bacteria through their acting um, layer, they will respond to it and they will not break down. So now I found a way where copying the literature, I will actually bind to the virus. Only when bound, I'll be virus either. And I will be virus either with a mechanism that works only on things that don't have a metabolism. Can this be done? Let me go back to the slide I showed you before. I'm, I'm, I found in the literature brilliant work by Sarid, where what she had done is gold nanoparticle coated with this molecule, mercapto ethylene sulfonic acid, and she had shown they were broad spectrum antiviral. I was working already in my lab back then on similar things, where what you see is I had a similar ligand, a similar molecule, only instead of being two CH2, two methylene long, it was 11 methylene long. So, and I knew that this molecule was really non-toxic. We had done in vivo st studies back then through IVs over our ways, but where we've, sh we've shown that we had very limited toxicity. So, we went and we studied in collaboration with David Lambo the antiviral activity of my nanoparticles against herpes simplex virus one, herpes simplex virus two, papilloma virus, two enveloped, one non enveloped virus. So, two viruses that have a membrane, one that doesn't. In all cases, we found nanomolar. Um, Alpha inhibitory ac uh, activity for our nanoparticles. And this is normal, totally normal. It what was in the literature. Notice that we have it, whether we have a second ligand or not. So it's it's there. Now, what did I just tell you? I just presented you a result of an experiment that is. Uh, how you calculate half inhibitory activity. It's a very trivial thing, but allow me one second to explain. You take a certain viral concentration, it's called titer in uh, this field. You mix it with different concentration of your compound. You wait, you take this mixed uh, solution and you put it on cells and you measure plaques or you measure RNA replication. So you measure the infectivity of your solution. If your compound has antiviral activity, the more you put, the less uh, these things is infective. And I was presenting you the EC50, the half inhibitory activity. Obviously, it should be obvious to you from this graph, you can read the EC99. So the amount of your compound that blocks two logs of infectivity, 99%. Now, once you know this amount, you can do another test, a test that was developed already in the 60s, the virus yield test, a test that tells you whether your interaction is reversible or irreversible. How do you do that? You take a certain viral titer, a viral concentration, you mix it with your compound, and your compound is at the EC99. So your compound, blocks two logs of infectivity by design. Then you take both the control and the virus plus the compound, and you dilute them serially in the same way. And at this point, you can plot the infectivity at the last dilution, basically. And what you will observe here is if 
the compound was biostatic reversible inhibition. At a certain dilution, you get dissociation of a compound. And so even though you started with something that blocked two logs of infectivity, you end up with uh, something that doesn't block infectivity at all, where the control is exactly identical to the control plus the compound. If your interaction is irreversible, nothing should change. You should stay at your initial two logs. Now, please keep this in mind. Whenever you see this type of plot, it means it's irreversible. This means it's reversible. And so with that in mind, let me move on to the next slide. In this slide, what I'm showing you is the infectivity of heparin, the literature compound, and the infectivity of my nanoparticle, which are the same than the literature, only 11 carbon longer, 11 methylene more longer. All three are nanomolar in preventing uh, infectivity. But as known in the literature, her heparin is reversible. These nanoparticles are reversible, but mine are irreversible. And that is the gist of my idea. I've made something from irreversible to irreversible and no cost on the toxicity because these and these have the same NTA and so on and so forth. Now, this compound as expected is irreversible against herpes simplex virus 2, papillomavirus, respiratory syncytial virus, um, a pseudovirus to represent HIV, and dengue virus 2. Not only that, we can do the antiviral test at different time point, and if we do it at different time point, we notice that the irreversibility is a slow event. Now, of course, viral inhibition based on binding, it takes milliseconds, it's diffusion limited, but the irreversibility is a slow effect, so it's an event that takes more time. It's a chain of events that happens later. This actually you can visually see in cryotm images, where you see uh, that a virus, once interacting with nanoparticles, end up being, ends up being broken. And here we can be more uh, specific or precise. This is herpes simplex virus one. You see the nanoparticles attached to the envelope. Once they attach, we see that they bud. And they bud before the nanoparticle, to be clear. But when the nanoparticles are there, the nanoparticles are always in a point of a budding and the budding starts becoming longer, much longer than when they are not there, with something like this always trailing. And at one point, the envelope breaks down and releases the capsid. The viral attachment ligand, which is the protein in the virus that attaches to heparin, typically depends on the virus, but typically on, remains on the capsid. So the nanoparticle now starts attaching to the capsid, these con concentrations here are probably where that, uh, uh, that specific protein is, and then they break down. The numbers here are the number of times we've seen this. And so you can think of them as representing the, how fast the event is. Now we can actually look at the mechanism. And for example, long time ago, we showed that if we have a, a virus and we mix it with nanoparticles that are not virucidal, this virus in a gel always runs in the same way with and without nanoparticle. But when we mix it with our virucidal nanoparticle, the virus runs somewhere else, which actually means that the virus has changed its physical chemical properties, so it's possibly broken. Now, all of this long introduction was to tell you that we've developed a new idea to make antiviral, but that idea is there not to be a nice self-assembly thing, but to try to do something that would eventually work in vivo. The first step from in vitro to in vivo has been doing ex vivo studies. Here, what you can observe is actually studies done on uh, vaginal tissue from donors, regrown at the air liquid interface and infected with HSV2, herpes simplex virus 2. As you can see, if we mix these 
uh, tissues with nanoparticle coated with ethylene glycol, so nothing that should interact with viruses, we got nothing. There is no effect. When we mix them at EC99 with uh, nanoparticles, the uh, Israeli developed one, the Sarid ones, at the beginning we block infection, but this block is quickly lost at day two and day three because by feeding the tissue, we are actually diluting and the effect that we would expect is happening. But our nanoparticles have only minimal regain of infectivity. This test was done in co-treatment, so virus and drug put at the same time. In pre-treatment, our nanoparticle went 18 hours before, or in post-treatment, our nanoparticle went 20, 24 hours before. And this particle actually worked also in vivo, intranasally, one shot against RSV. But I'll get to in vivo later. Once we arrived to this point, I went to my group and I asked a very hard question. Do we need nano? For a nano group like mine, it's a hard question to ask. But if you have influenza, will you put gold in your lungs? If you have this or that, will you accept nanoparticle as a drug? The hard answer is probably not. But at that point, the gist of my invention was something that has a scaffold that can multivalently present mimics of heparin linked to the scaffold through, an hydro, through hydrophobic linkers. Multivalently, because it actually helps to bind, but I think I've not proven, also because it helps to break, okay? So Sam Jones, who just recently uh, moved as a prof to University of Birmingham from University of Manchester, he actually developed uh, cyclodextrin coated with the exact same molecule that we put on um, the nanoparticle. Why that? Because cyclodextrin and naturally occurring sugar used, for example, in deodorants in North America, so commonly used, but also because when you put this, what you have, it looks a lot like a drug called captisol, where you add molecules like this to cyclodextrin, only short. And Captisol is an FDA-approved solubilizer for chemotherapies. So, look like a drug. Does it behave like a drug? It does. It's antiviral and it's irreversible. This is a commercial version similar to this molecule where shorter linkers are there. They're antiviral. They are reversible. Very simple. And our psychodextrin is broad spectrum in a viral Seedal way against many, many viruses. It's, it's a good drug. Uh, for example, we did a resistance test, and while acyclovir, which is the approved drug, in eight passages has roughly a seven, eight time increase in EC50, so the virus is mutating against that drug. In our case, that's not the case. The EC50 stays the same after eight passages. We've done in vivo studies here in a prophylactic way. So we made creams, like we were vaginal creams, against HSV2 in a mouse experiment. And both the nanoparticles, and here done the nanoparticle, and the cyclodexin worked well against HSV2. I have to say that mice are not a great model for HSV2, just that, but we, we had good results. The great things of working with molecules is that you can actually use um, known assays to test how they work. So here I'm presenting a DNA release assay that shows that indeed our um, viruses, uh, our cyclodextrin elicit the release of DNA from HSV2, the vi target viruses, upon mixing. And, uh, and so that means we are actually breaking the envelope, we're breaking the capsid, and DNA is released. And that's the gist of a mechanism. Uh, Peter Kral has done um, molecular dynamics simulation. Here, you see um, the 
recept, uh, um, receptor binding to a trimer for uh, papilloma, if I'm correct, mixed with cyclodextrins that don't have the long hydrophobic, and you see the trimers have this distance. But when you mix it with cyclodextrins that have the hydrophobic, more or less here, you see the trimers spaces out. Is this pressure that I was telling you about at the beginning? Really, we assert pressure and these things spaces out. We can actually do systematic studies using, for example, nanoparticles. And we show that nanoparticles coated with ligands that have different length hydrophobic and sulfonic acid, they all have basically the same IC50, but it's only above five that in length that they become irreversible before they are reversible. And if I have a five and I mix with octentile more hydrophobic, I can get the um, irreversibility. So it's the amount of hydrophobic that counts. Uh, size also matters. And uh, we can do this also with cyclodextrins. But in the interest of time, I want to get to other points. Now, what I've shown to you is that I can get gold nanoparticles that are antivirals. In that same paper, you find iron oxide nanoparticles. I can get um, cyclodextrins, but here what I'm showing you that I can get also polybranched po polymers that look a little bit like dendromers if you want to actually act as antivirals and to be irreversible. In these two words, my small molecules are actually micromolar while the nanoparticles are nanomolar. The, mo the cyclodexin are all organics, the nanoparticles are not. This work combines the two. They are all organic, but they're nanomolar. They're nanoparticles, so they're big, if you want. And this work is a great collaboration with Rainer Hag at the uh, University of Berlin. Now, let's start questioning the initial assumption. So, I've shown you that I can imitate heparin sulfate proteoglycans, but can I imitate other family of viruses? So can I imitate uh, sialic acid that is another family of virus where the most important virus is influenza? To do that, I need to imitate sialic acid and we do it with these three sugars here and we can put them on cyclodextrin and what we get is something that is quite nicely um, um, nanomolar this time, even though it's a small molecule, antiviral against influenza. With this, we actually did the control of changing the hydrophobic linkers into hydrophilic ligands, ethylene glycols. And we get two compounds that both are nanomolar against influenza, but one is irreversible, the other is reversible. When we go ex vivo on respiratory tissue regrown at the air liquid interface, the irreversible one shows long lasting protection, while the reversible one does not. Now, with this molecule, we've done a ton of in vivo. And let me present this in vivo. I should say that these data were done at NIH in the US, and these are data done intranasally, where the compound is given intranasally to mice. The group size was 10, and we compared ourselves to oseltamivir, which you may know for its commercial name, Tamiflu, one of the best antiviral drugs that is there. Definitely the most accepted. Now, oseltamivir was given intrabuccal. Now, our initial concentration that we were allowed were very low, very because NIH was concerned that virucidal compounds will be toxic. We, they, after a preliminary toxicity study that we passed with flying marks, they actually, we were allowed to proceed to the experiment. And these are the results of the experiment. This is H1N1, California night, the last pandemic strain of influenza. And you can see that the mice in the placebo group, nine out of 10 died. In our compound, in a concentration dependent way, we could save 
three, four, and seven mice, but oseltamivir given intrabuccal at basically 10 times our concentration saved all time. But this is co-treatment. The viral challenge and the drug are given in the same anesthesia at the same time. Let's see what happens when you actually go in something that makes more sense. We go in therapeutic treatment. That is, we go eight hours or 24 hours post-infection. This time in the placebo group, all mice die. Before it was one that survived. So you can imagine this experiment as a plus of my one uh, error, if you want. Oseltamivir, as it was known, loses efficacy very quickly. Eight hours post-infection from saving 10. Now it's saving only two. 24 hours post-infection is not saving any. It's only lengthening the mice lifetime of one and a half day. As a higher concentration than before, this is the high concentration than before. Now it's low concentration. We save three or four, eight, uh, sorry, nine or nine, 10 or eight mice. So in a concentration dependent way, basically we save more and more mice and we're not losing efficacy more or less in the first 24 hours. The treatment that I showed you was a five day treatment because that's a standard for sultanivir. We can go to three day treatment and show that we still have efficacy even 48 hours post-infection. So we have a very long uh, therapeutic window. We can actually check that the mechanism we think is the correct one. To do that, we can do an in vivo experiment where now we don't do a lethal challenge. We lower the dose of virus given to the mice so that in the vehicle and in the untreated, you see the mice recover uh, within eight days. What am I showing here? The viral load in the lungs of mice. And so you can see that the mice are sick, they're getting better by day six, but the day eight, they're fine. Um, now, when we give our compound at the medium and high doses that I showed you in the previous slides, you see that already at day six, at day four, sorry, the mice start feeling better, but definitely at day six, they are better. So we are lowering the viral load so that the mice recover much faster. That's our mechanism. We have confirmed this in ferrets, only one experiment so far. We have designed drugs that work also against SARS-CoV-2 with the same mechanism against, again, uh, in a nebula, in a, uh, we've given them in a nebulized way uh, um, to hamsters. And you can see from this brown curve here that they definitely recover much faster than uh, if they don't have a drug and even uh, if they were given Paxlovid, which is the best drug out there. And us and Paxlovid, when we look at the viral load, we have efficacy only on day four, uh, on day eight, sorry, where we have statistically significant less viral load in the lungs um, and in the nose. In the lungs, we are as good as Paxlovid. Now, uh, I'm going to close the last five minutes, challenging one more assumption. And that assumption is, do we need a sugar to actually target the virus? Because that's what I've shown you so far. We are imitating either heparin or we are imitating, um, uh, or we are imitating uh, sialic acid. We have done this by replacing this with a peptide. And we challenge even another thing in this study. Do we need envelope virus? I showed papilloma, but, uh, but uh, this, we, cho we chose a very tough cookie, bacteriophages. These are very far from what I've shown you so far. These are bacterial viruses, waterborne. So very sturdy viruses. And what we did, we did phage display to find the peptides that target bacteriophages. And we put these peptides on cyclodextrin and on nanoparticles. Here is the whole um, characterization we did. But the important part here is that we were able 
to inhibit bacteriophages in an irreversible way in, uh, as well. Even though we were talking them with a peptide, even though these things are waterborne and non-enveloped. Why did we do this? Because bacteriophages are good viruses. Why would you inhibit that? But in fermenters, when there is a bacteriophage contamination, you need to stop the fermenter and disinfect for two days. So for industries that use fermenters, it's a bad thing. And we showed that in this fermentation concentration, we could actually really block the development of bacteriophages in realistic conditions. I will close here thanking my collaborators. I want to thank Silke Kroll, who is the first collaborator I've had. She's a biochemist. We were, I was, I had the side lab in Milan and we were sharing it. And these are the two PhD that worked on this. Maria uh, mostly worked on the vaccine. Marco worked on the first inhibition thing, but really the first person that did everything was Patrizia Andreozzi. I need to thank David Lambo and the PhD students that dedicated half of her PhD to this, Valeria Cagno. She was a virologist and she had to learn to work on nanoparticles. She then went to work with my um, Swiss collaborators, Caroline Tapparel and Laurent Kaiser. Don't get this picture for you. Caroline is more or less 170 uh, in height. Um, and uh, Valeria worked for Caroline, and then she's now become an independent uh, uh, group leader uh, professor, if you want, at, Univer at University of Lausanne. Paolo has done the initial work on this, and now is the co-founder of a startup I had that's trying to bring this in the clinic, so I do have a conflict of interest. Marie did the hard job of uh, cryo-TM, and I told you what Sam did, what Peter did. Marie Galou did the first in vivo, against RSV. This is my current group. I really want to thank Yong, Zhu Yong. He's, she has developed the, the molecule against SARS-CoV-2. Francesco Giatti, she's developing molecules against influenza. And Matteo Gasbari, who did a lot during uh, pandemic to really bring this forward. Lucas Richter has done the antibacteriophages work. And Wang He Yuin has developed uh, a new approaches recently. Uh, Li Sha has done also uh, things that are new on this work. And I really need to thank the very generous funding of the Vernon Siemens Foundation that really is helping me bring in this towards the clinic. And thank you for your patience and your attention. Thank you very much for. Uh this wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it uh, thoroughly. Um, let me now introduce uh, uh, the challengers. And uh, can you see my shared screen now? Uh, no, but still my screen. Do you want me to yes. stop sharing? There you now go. It, now it's now there. It. Yeah. So then I would like uh, first to introduce uh, Professor uh, Xiao Gang Liu from the National University of Singapore. He is in the Department of Chemistry and his research interests include the study of energy transfer and lanthanide doped nanomaterials, the applications of optical nanomaterials for neuromodulation and light field imaging, and the development of advanced X ray imaging uh, scintillators and prototyping of electro electronic tools for assistive technologies. Well, I know Leo very well from my time in Singapore, and he has won basically every award that is to be had in Singapore, uh, including the SNCC Singapore Award for Solid State Chemistry and Materials, the NUS Outstanding Research Award, but also uh, the President Science Award. Uh, he is also uh, a member or board member of quite a number of uh, uh, scientific journals, uh, including Nanoscale Horizons and Nanoladders. Uh, our next panelist is Wendy Barkley. Uh, her expertise is in the field of respiratory viruses, and particularly uh, influenza virus. And she studies uh, mainly uh, the molecular and cellular basis uh, for these pathways. 
and host range uh, restrictions for transmi uh, transmissibility of influenza viruses. After she had been at the University of Reading, uh, she moved uh, in 2007 to Imperial College. Uh, she graduated uh, in natural sciences from Cambridge University and uh, obtained a PhD degree from Common Cold Unit in Salisbury under the supervision of David Terrell and Fred Brown. And during her PhD studies, uh, she studied the human, uh, human response, human immune response to rhinoviruses. Uh, she's an expert in molecular virology skills, uh, which she mainly obtained as a postdoc uh, uh, under the supervision of Professor Jeff Almond at Reading. Um, and then finally, I would also uh, introduce our challenger, uh, Xiao Qian Ma from Caltech, who is a PhD student under the supervision of Professor Wei Gao in the Becky Chern Department of Medical Engineering. And his research uh, interests include the design and control of biomedical applications of micro robots for drug delivery and precision surgery. Um, this is then now opening up our uh, uh, discussion table. And I would like to invite uh, our challenger, uh, Sian Tma, uh, to kick off this uh, discussion. Thank you so much for Professor Stalachi's talk. That's very inspiring. That can help so many people fighting the uh, deadly disease that is uh, related to virus. And thank you for Nihos, Professor Nihos for hosting. Uh, so today, uh, after the talk, I'm really interested in, uh, about the molecular structure design of the, uh, of the uh, changing from the reversible binding of uh, to the virus to an irreversible binding one because I'm not a material scientist, so I'm kind of curious about what what are the type typical guidelines for for your modification Absolutely. of the molecules. Absolutely, I thank you for this question because really my where I am with my research is in determining design rules to design these drugs. The drugs that I've shown you are examples. I'm sure people in the future, if this approach will be successful, it may not be, uh, uh, will actually be able to design many, many more molecules like this. What you need is hydrophobic flexible linkers that will actually have a strong multivalent hydrophobic contact to a virus. Now, of course, if you want something hydrophobic as a drug, it's not so simple because you also want the drug to be water soluble. If not, I mean, we're not going to inject a piece of plastic in our body and say it's antiviral. We're just going to feel sick. Um, so this needs to be compensated in ways to have the molecule soluble. The more soluble it is, the better, because you want the hydrophobic to act as such only upon binding to the virus. And so what you want is to complement this hydrophobic with groups that attach to the virus, but also, and this is where you have to be careful, provide significant solubility. Once you have that, you have your, your drug. I well, see. For now, you have your putative drug. I need to go to the clinic to show it's a drug. Okay, thank you so much. And... Uh... And also in your talk, you do you do the in vivo study, uh, uh, like for the nanoparticles. I learned that they can be easily cleared by our immune system, but you show that your particles can last for a long time inside our body. So I'm kind of interested. In, like your nanoparticles may not so much be influenced by the immune clearance. Is that correct? No, so you have a very good question. And the answer to this is that I'm not really sure exactly my nanoparticle what happens when given intranasally. We had shown them in the past uh, through, through IV and we know they are somewhat cleared. Intranasally, when they are in the lung, I have no idea. We focused ourselves a lot on the molecules that are small and all organics and enzymatic 
can be degraded. And uh, we are doing PK, we know they get cleared and so on and so forth, right? Um, my approach, I know I'm not so popular with some of my nano colleagues, is if you can do it with a small molecule, why doing it with a nano? That it's extra complication, for example, in the interaction with the immune system, for example. Uh, there's no need for that. Now, in future, if we were to want to deliver our nanoparticle in the brain because of meningitis. Now, I can tell you, we've tested this, the cyclodexin don't pass the blood-brain bind at all. There, there is an advantage of a nanoparticle because you have a need, right? Then you can say, okay, I have some side effects, but they come at the gain of that. Do you see? Um, yeah. So the work of a nanoparticle stopped just to say there is efficacy. There was no obvious toxicity, but let's go now and study in depth the small molecule. Okay, I see. Um, and I think maybe the last last question I would like to is a broader broader question. Uh, so there are there are always kind of emerging virus, maybe because of the global warming, maybe they are released from the, under the glass, under the ice. So uh, how do you see the challenge like your antivirus can face the unpresented very, very good uh, question. virus? Yeah. I'm going to say something at the risk of Wendy actually correcting me because she's way more expert than me, but like two orders of magnitude more. But first of all, there's no conspiracy theory. The emerging of a virus depends on the proximities of the host. And so we live in a world that is always more and more populated. So, and the proximity depends on the square of the population, right? So in the 70s, we were 5 million. When we're going to be 10, the probability of uh, emerging will be 10 divided by 5 squared. So four times more. You see, you see what I mean? So it's really that, okay? Nothing more. The, these uh, viruses that from the eyes uh, uh, come, I've heard this story. I don't particularly believe it very much because, yes, the release of <laughs> an infected virus will be there, but it's not a given that the host that existed in the glacial time still exists. So if, if we release a mammoth virus, probably it's not going to be uh, good for us. Now, as for your question, this is exactly why I would like broad spectrum antiviral. The truth is that my drug that uh, works now against SARS CoV 2, we had already designed it before SARS CoV 2. Because SARS CoV, it's an HPG virus and it was there, it's ready. The idea of a broad spectrum is that. Then, of course, we could, uh, right now, we don't have a drug that works against. Rotavirus, which is my, you know, nemesis. I went into this because of a kid that die of diarrhea. I'm still doing nothing against diarrhea. Uh, but maybe something emerges that's pandemic and has the shell of rotavirus and the broad spectrum doesn't work. But maybe not. The reason why we are doing things against influenza is because, you know, every year a new viral, a new influenza strain emerges. We know that, right? And maybe with our approach, we'll be ready. So that's that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Maybe now I can invite one of the panelists uh, to follow up. Perhaps we can start with Liu. Okay, yeah, as wonderful talk, I think, Francesco. I really like it. I just uh, curious. Thank you. So it, yeah, you present the uh, two ty types of uh, strategy. One is uh, the gold nanoparticle using the uh, sulfonate. The molecules. Is that curious? Because uh, um, not quite a many research groups they actually try to get away from the uh, metal nanoparticles. For for example, Chad Chad Milken, right? You know, he's try to use it. And this is why we go to cyclodextrin. That's yeah, exactly, that, exactly yeah. the same reason. That's why okay. we went to Landrimer. All organic is much better. Huh. It's going to be enzymatically degraded. It's much better. But. Yeah, yeah. Coming back to the the, the first project, this one uh, use a sulfonic, but because I was just curious, um, you you probably done the control experiment, right? Without the um, metal nanoparticles, so 
maybe the results are not as good as a uh, uh, whistle. So, so if you just use the ligand, so yeah. if you just use the ligand, mm -hmm. you're not multivalent. The binding constant is not enough. You don't bind to the virus. You're not antivalent. Mm -hmm. If you use ligands that are too short, you bind, but you're reversible. All you have to have enough ligand with enough density and enough length. So, so, so that, yeah, uh, yeah, I understand that. So, so the question is: It possible to, uh, you know, replace this inorganic matter nanoparticle with some bicompatible small size polymer? Yeah, by cells. Yeah. So absolutely, the core needs to be there to multivalently present a sufficient right. density of ligands, and that's it. M any core will work. And yeah. it's not a given. The core I've chosen so far are the best. Not okay. Even. Okay. Yeah. As I see, the, the second approach, the psychodaction, yeah, mm -hmm. is quite promising. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you have this uh, bifunctional, you know, targeting groups introduced to the, the psychodaction, for example, multivalent. Uh, yeah, so all of our psychodexy must be multivalent to work. If yeah. not, they don't work. Okay. Now, what I have not done the control, uh, Shogun, is yeah. to replace the sulfonate with something that binds so strongly that don't need multivalent and only have multivalent hydrophobic. Okay. Multivalent hydrophobic you need. It's not a given that you need multivalent binding. If you were to have a magic peptide that binds by itself already in nanomolar, mm -hmm. maybe this works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you, maybe are not you, a peptide, maybe something else. Yeah. Who knows? How, how close? It's just a, you know, what has a very strict question. How close are you? Are you doing a clinical trial? Or? Oh, well, this is a, not a stupid question. It's a hard question to answer. So yeah. I am exactly where I showed. That is, I am at what I would call larger animals. So ferrets for influenza. Okay. Free clinical. Yeah. Uh, which is the second species after mice, and these are the best animal model for that particular virus. Mm -hmm. um, it's more challenging, for example, in the case of HSP2, uh, herpes simplex virus 2, mm -hmm. because there's no really good animal model. So uh, I will have to do something at one point, but uh, there the development is fuzzier. If you want simple, mm -hmm. you have to skip a step, but you also have to yeah. be sure. You're doing okay. Yeah, understandable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can uh, jump in uh, quickly because uh, a certain Chin uh, also wanted to to thank you for the wonderful talk, and he asked uh, if you are moving towards uh, commercialization. Well, I Absolutely. suppose uh, you are trying Absolutely. clinical trials uh, already. Yes. That I, I, yeah. I, I. So. In developing a drug, I prefer to use the word translation because first you need to do the clinical trial. Commercialization is very far. Uh, but yes, mm -hmm. I am pointing towards translation. That's the goal. And it's a goal, I want to restate, not necessarily be, be to say this is the best drug, but to show this design and then to open the gate to the community to develop. Mm -hmm. And myself, I was also intrigued by this multivalent binding. Uh, by coincidence, as a matter of fact, I did my PhD with uh, David Reinhardt and Yuri Jan Huskins. Absolutely. And we started a lot of my well. whole PhD was about multivalent binding on cyclodextrin layers. And um, yeah, you mentioned that because of the multivalent binding, you can create a pressure that hopefully eventually would break no, up it's, the it's, virus. So it's, it's multivalent binding binds you there. And now you have proximity of hydrophobic, which mm -hmm. binds in a secondary structure, which stretches, and that's the pressure. So it's the second uh, step after multivalent binding. It's, it's this second step that applies the pressure. If you just do uh, multivalent binding, you just bind. You must have a second thing that wants to bind stronger than the first one, and that's the hydrophobic contact. Yeah. Ah, okay, that is how it works. Yeah, and... Yeah, and since uh, yeah, become uh, uh, with this uh, supramolecular chemistry background, 
Um, I, I was wondering if you, yeah, when I think of multivalent binding, I think of certain binding pockets and you have multiple of these binding pockets. And of course, the length of the feathers must be uh, matching and you have multiple interactions, likely ionic, likely hydrophobic. Do you have uh, any ideas of the association constant of individual binding events and how they multiply? No, I don't. But as I said, if the, the multivalent binding was studied a lot. And so people like Rainer Haag, but also Julian, uh, Julian uh, have done a lot on this. So a lot of this can be found in the literature. Of course, not precisely on my compound, right? So it needs to be redone. We are yeah. mostly uh, trying to characterize the second step, yeah, the irreversible. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, then uh, let me move on to uh, our next uh, challenger. Uh, or, or Leo, do you have another question? Uh, sorry. No, I don't have. I'm, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, thank let's, you. Let's give the floor to Wendy now. <laughs> yeah, then we go and move on to Wendy. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. This is um, obviously an audience that I'm not very used to, but it's really exactly. fascinating. And Francesco, you did a fantastic job of the biology. So congratulations. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, I mean, my questions are nearly all around the biology, but maybe I start with one. I mean, the image you show uh, of the herpes virus being pulled, it, it appears to be pulling in just one place. Um, is that what you expect from the chemistry? And no, is there any, no. so I wonder, I mean, some people with structural virology now are beginning to show that virus capsids are not completely symmetrical, but sometimes there's um, a difference in the capsid, perhaps where it finally closed. Do you think this is revealing one area of the virus capsid, which is weaker than the others? Oh, thanks. For this is illuminating for me and you capture the one thing that I never understood of my images why they're not symmetric why does it break on one side and but it is like this the images are like this probably you're right you're telling me of things I didn't know uh yeah it's probably there is this opening part which will be where uh things target right that's where the virus wants to bind absolutely yes. yeah Definitely, I mean most my images are asymmetric for sure I mean, if you think about it, usually the virus has a pore through which the genome can come and go. And so this can be a weak point, an Achilles heel in the capsid. And this is the one which is maybe fracturing. Um, so it, it would be very interesting uh, to approach that with some mutant viruses, uh, for yeah. example, that are changed in this area and, and see if you can just sort of validate that. Um, so the... The other, the other sort of very biological point, um, or maybe more practical point, is the use of, of these. I mean, for me, the COVID pandemic really revealed a vulnerability because most people don't want to wear a mask all day long. Um, but I can imagine that they might be comfortable to make a nasal spray once a day or twice a day. Um, so I know in the animal studies, uh, I think it's twice a day that you've administered. No, once a day. Once a day. Once a once day. A day. I mean, I'm wondering if there's anything that you can do to make the drug last longer in the nose, to, to stick around longer, because, you know, we have this mucociliary beating, we have the, the physiology of the nose is really designed to get things out of it as soon as they go in. Uh, is there something clever you can do with the chemistry to keep it there for longer? So, um, let me tell you my thing. So, I find this very fascinating and the way to go. The way I always start is, first I need to show this thing works in a clinical trial. And somehow to me, it's simpler to think, to develop a drug, a classical therapeutic drug you take when you have a symptom, you go and you show. Once we've done that, uh, now, what you are asking is closer to my field than what I'm doing now, that is to try to develop, for example, a carrier for this thing, a polymeric carrier. And people have done this, that, that have mucous adhesion or ciliary adhesion to keep this thing in the nose, absolutely. And then to, to help people, absolutely. That is something. But I think if I were to go that way, uh, 
clinical trials would be extremely difficult, right? Because now uh, you probably have to do something like a challenge study or, or something like that, right? Which can only be done in England, in the world. Uh, and, well, yeah. You know, with, with influenza, yeah. you, you can do it with in influence. more places. You can also think of household studies. Um, you know, people people come home, they are infected. And the beauty of your compound or your drug is that it is broad acting. So in the in the winter season, for example, when a lot of people get respiratory infections, you wouldn't need necessarily to diagnose specifically which virus it was. You could say that as soon as one member of the household is infected, all the other household members begin using the spray, for example, to see if they can protect themselves from, from being infected. So you're right. Th these are complicated studies, to, but in my opinion, the real power here is at the population level to try to prevent outbreaks um, rather than necessarily going for hospitalized cases, for, for example. And I'm not, I would love also to do hospitalized cases uh, because it's part of my dream in developing countries. But definitely the idea of a population level to use this as a, as a, uh, as a drug is definitely there. And to me, that's a step that after we show efficacy in uh, phase two clinical trial, it's easy to implement. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are plenty of ways that uh, I can make the, the molecule in a carrier and something uh, slow release that where it can be used. Do you think it needs to be in the nose because even just protecting the lower respiratory part, even in the, in the nose, or you think really it needs to be at the point of entry? Well, you make you make a, a good point because this comes back to how you want to use the drug. If you want to use the drug to block transmission, then self-administration is easiest to the nose. And most yeah. people think that transmission is from nose to nose. But if you want to use the drug to treat somebody who's got very sick because the virus dis descends from the nose Thank to you. the lung, you may need to nebulize the drug uh, to get it into the lung, which is where the virus is currently causing and the problem. Which is what we are thinking now, nebulizer yeah. and to go yeah. deep. Yeah. And one more point, if I may. I mean, these are virucidal compounds. Do you think of using them to coat a mask or a surface? We in, in, are doing that and mm -hmm. uh, with success. Um, what what is what happens in once you start coating, maybe not for a mask, eh? uh, is, for example, a surface, you can release a lot of a toxicity constraint because these things will not enter the body. And so we can make, we're making things even more potent if you want. In a mask, if you have to wear it for long, probably it's better to stay at the same level of a drug, honestly, mm -hmm. because you're still breathing, still very close to the point of entry, but absolutely, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So anybody else has uh, maybe another pending question or perhaps from the audience? Oh, I also don't see anything uh, dripping in uh, via the chat box. Well, then I, I have uh, a quick question. Ah, you have one have question. A quick, yeah, uh, Professor Stalacci, for the, uh, uh, I'm just curious, like, why do you choose intravenous? Because also for the respiration, maybe it's it's the best way, but for other like HIV, is that also very effective? Now, this is a very good question and we can address this. So we chose intranasal for respiratory virus for two reasons. The first one, intranasal, it goes in the lungs, the drug is already where it's supposed to be. Let's start by that. But the other thing is an antiviral openly, maybe you would want it as a pill. But the design of my drug is such it's highly amphiphilic because in, in, and I explained this before and multivalent is relatively big. So as a pill, it will never work. It won't pass the GI tract, uh, the GI barrier. So then you can do it IV, for example, but why would you do an IV for influenza? You see, intranasal nebulizer, things like that looks simpler. Having yeah. said that, we, we, we have data that we can, it will, can work. And I think other ways could also work, other, other um, uh, delivery way, but that are not book, that, that, that don't go through through that, absolutely. Yeah, from from 
uh, the micro robot from the micro robot point of view, I would say if if we can kind of modify these kind of molecules on the micro robots, uh, the micro robots itself, uh, they can they have the ability to penetrate uh, the mucus. Uh, there are some studies showing that also maybe the blood brain barrier some of the groups also doing that so if that would help that maybe help the intravenous whether intravenous or the just the digest that would be good and as i said there are also things like meningitis and things like that that you need to get to understand how do you get there yeah that's for sure yeah thank you for bringing up this very nice idea um Maybe I have still one more small question going back to, to, the, to the chemistry since we talk about cyclodextrins. Cyclodextrins, you can also change the shape and diameter and you can actually also fill in uh, the cavity with all sorts of uh, uh, gas molecules. Are you also exploring uh, those avenues to try to improve? We are the exploring the shape to see whether it's better or not. Uh, I will tell you once we have a data. And the cavity is an interesting thing. And actually, now that you say this, I want to say something. Um, HIV and uh, hepatitis C drugs, they're not one drug. They're cocktail of drugs, right? My drug, I always thought, has an ideal member of a cocktail, if you want, because it's extracellular. Other drugs are intracellular. Really difficult to think they will interact. So it's just a cocktail, okay? Now, in the thinking of a cocktail, one can also think, they are solubilizer. You can put in the cavity some other drugs, right? And, and bring them to the virus and so on and so forth. Why not? In a virus, you always have to think. They mutate. Uh, they mutate rapidly. You need to use multi-pronged approach, cocktails, and things like that. That's the way to go. Yeah, that is interesting. Uh, you can basically you have the entire supramolecular chemistry toolbox now at your disposal to try that. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. fascinating. Well. After you have withstood uh, all the questions and challenges from the panelists and the challenger, I think there is only one more thing uh, for me uh, left to do. And that is uh, to hand you over uh, the very beautiful certificate uh, from iConnex. Um, I think maybe we can switch back to my screen again and then I can show it to you. Yeah, here you go. Thank you beautiful very much. Yeah. <laughs> so congratulations. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, then uh, next week we have uh, uh, again a wonderful speaker, Louis Liz Marsan uh, from the University of Vigo. And the session will be moderated by Lan Fu. And the panelists will be uh, Alicia herself, Jarwin Nam, and Sarah Abelda Sela. Uh, so I hope you all uh, to see you all next week again. Thank you and bye bye. Okay, bye.不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界为我鼓掌。不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗。I can, I can。什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量 ？I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越。
创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的。心中无限的力量。